Hey guys, welcome to another study on the book of James. I'm working on changing a few things up as far as backdrop and where we record and the audio and everything. So I thought we would try this today, give you a little different view in my office and see how we like this. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is that we continue to glorify Jesus in our study. And that's what we're going to try to do as we work our way through the book of James. If you've been following along with our study, you know that we are near the end of the third chapter of James. And the last study that we did together was called The Tongue is a Fire. And that encompassed the first 15 verses or so from the, book of, from the third chapter of James, in which James deals with the power of the tongue. He doesn't really go too deeply into the power of new creation, how you can be transformed, how the, the fruit of the spirit of self-control can cause you to change the way that you talk, how you can speak positively and condition your atmosphere that way. Um, James doesn't deal with that too much. We did, and show you how the Apostle Paul would have dealt with that issue. I don't want to present the book of James as a contrast to Paul, because although there are some of those things in the book of James, if we're being very honest, but I do want you to know that James is early in the development, and then Paul is later in the development, and so the, the growth pains, the growing pains of the early church are very evident in James's writings as he doesn't have the grace revelation that Paul would have. And we don't exclude James's writings because of that. We just understand that there are people in, in the church now at different places and different stages in the development that they might have in understanding the grace of God. With that said, I'd like to say a prayer and, and then we're going to jump into um, the... the, the I, the 13th verse or so of the book of James. All right. Father, I just thank you for our audience today, whomever and wherever they might be. We thank you for this opportunity to teach your word, and we ask your help as we open up the sacred scriptures and we see what you would say to us. We ask that, Father, you anoint the ears to hear the word and the hearts to apply the word, and that, Father, we find peace in your word. Teach us the things you'd have us to know so that we may be in front of the world, the people that we know we are, in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm in the third chapter of James, as we said before, and I want to start, I think a moment ago I said that we did the first 15. That's not true. We did the first 12 in the last study because the first 12 verses deal with the tongue and the power of the tongue. And so we want to deal with beginning in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom, This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's verses 13 through 18. That's the end of the third chapter of the book of James. And as you saw on our subtitle, we are subtitling this lesson, Selfish Ambition, the reason for that is because in two different verses in that passage, James deals with the idea of self-seeking, which is the phrase in the Greek closer to selfish ambition. Uh, he uses the phrase in verse 14. He uses the phrase again in verse 16 and uses it in a negative way, of course, in that if there is selfish ambition, then all the motives are going to be messed up because that ambition has caused uh, a, an amazing amount of problems. But let's frame the context, if we could, for a moment. James is actually contrasting two kinds of wisdom. He's contrasting the, and I want to use it from the text, verse 13. He's contrasting the meekness of wisdom with a wisdom that is, verse 15, earthly, sensual, demonic. He calls one above he calls one earthly. So one, let's say it this way, is heavenly wisdom, and the other is earthly wisdom. Uh, 
the heavenly wisdom is characterized by a meekness, while the earthly wisdom is characterized by selfish ambition or self-seeking. So there's two ways to govern yourself in the world in regards to wisdom. You can govern yourself according to the earthly, which is earthly, sensual, demonic. It doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. It means it's of the spirit of the world. And what is the spirit of the world but self-seeking and envy or selfish ambition? And we'll dig into that in a little bit. Or you can govern yourself according to the other wisdom, which is above, heavenly, or as it's characterized by James, full of meekness. And we'll get into both of those as we go because we're really setting you up to see two sides of wisdom, how one is from above, how one is from beneath. This isn't meant to condemn any of you or me, but we all are in the same boat. We all often use the wrong kind of wisdom. And rather than taking the wisdom that is from above, that is meek, we often take that which is earthly, sensual, or demonic, and we'll see as we go what, what that means. I want to deal with one little side issue in regards to this passage before I dig into the meat of those two wisdoms. And it's found in the end of the 13th verse. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And I, as I was noting this out this morning, just asking the Spirit, where would you have us to go? One of the things that popped in my spirit, and I wrote it in my notes, was grace demands an accountability of our works. Not an accountability so that we are righteous. You are not righteous based upon your works. You are righteous based upon the finished work and your faith in Christ is you reconciling yourself to that knowledge. But, and it's a big but, <laughs> there is an accountability that comes with our actions under grace because we're king's kids. In the same manner that, I, I, I'm not, I don't claim to know everything about royalty in, in Great Britain, but I am intrigued by it um, in that there is a, a, a almost a family persona in the royal family of we don't do that sort of thing. We don't do that. Why? Because we're the royal family. We don't go there. We don't get caught doing that. We don't say that. We don't and some look at that and go, oh, that's fake. But I kind of look at it like knowing your place and realizing your position. And I look at it as very noble in the, uh, in, in the kingdom realm. That you would know who your father is. You would know your own role. You'd know you're a prince. And there are just some things in life where you would say, no, not going to do that. Maybe at some point in your Christianity, you would have said, nope, not going to do that because I don't want to go to hell. But now that you realize your salvation is secure in Christ, a lot of things you'll look at and say, no, I don't want to do that because I'm in the royal family. We don't act like that. We don't do that. To show you spiritual or scriptural, rather, accountability in regards to this, there is an accountability of works Paul would talk about. Look at Galatians chapter 6. And in the fourth verse, actually, I want to read the first four verses. The first three, you kind of set it up. Four really is where we're going. But listen. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Notice what you're doing. Examining your own work. Why? And this is Paul, who has just wrote a book to, to us about, actually he's writing it to the Galatians, but we benefit, about how your faith is not in your works. You are not servants, but you are sons. And then he turns right around in the sixth chapter and says, guys, you still got to examine your own works. Now, why would he say examine your works if it wasn't important to examine your works? It's not important to examine them so that you are righteous or so that you uh, can approve, be approved of God, but it is important to examine your works because you're dealing with other people. Notice that you're restoring people with a spirit of gentleness. You're considering yourself. You're bearing their burdens. You're fulfilling the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? Love one another as I have loved you. So you're fulfilling that law. 
If you think you're something, you'll realize quickly that you're nothing. You'd just be deceiving yourself anyway. So spend some time figuring out your own works. So again, you take that back to James 3. Show by good conduct that your works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So, And this is an aside before we dig into the two kinds of wisdom. But there, it's very, very important for, for believers to realize that their conduct does mean something. It does not put them in heaven or hell. Faith in Jesus is what makes us righteous. But our conduct is a reflection of who we know we are in Christ. Which, to me, and I've noticed this uh, uh, hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, even just since coming into the message of grace. If a believer doesn't really understand their place in Christ, they'll live like it. And they'll live so beneath their place. But if they realize their place, you'll see a, a standard of conduct that is reflective of their father. Okay? Now, let's break down. After that long intro, let's break down those two sides. The heavenly wisdom versus the earthly wisdom, which is sensual. If you have bitter envy, we're in 14. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking. Self-seeking is the Greek for, is better translated out of the Greek, selfish ambition. If you have selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, it's demonic. Let's keep going because it describes it again. For wherever there's envy and self-seeking or envy and selfish ambition, confusion in every evil thing are there. There are twin killers in ministry. I don't know why, but I just really felt compelled as I was thinking about that this morning to emphasize ministry as much as anything else. But there are twin killers, envy and selfish ambition. I think that the reason why they are twin killers is they are masked so well as vision and determination. Envy and selfish ambition often go hand in hand. They are good bedfellows in ministry. They shouldn't be, but they are. I'll start with envy because selfish ambition is our subtitle. You'll realize that without the definition of envy, you're not going to really understand selfish ambition. James links them together for a reason, I think which will be made clear as we go. But the early church had a real issue with envy. It was something that kept cropping its head up over and over. Let's deal with the Greek. Then let's see it in the text. The Greek word for envy is photonos. Listen to this definition. It's negatively energized with a jealous, embittered mind. Or really, it's displeasure at another person's good and it's pleasure at another person's failure. And a lot of Christians deal with envy and don't acknowledge the envy. In fact, they're very quick to mask over the envy with, oh, oh, that's pitiful. I'll be praying for you. But if there's that hint inside of, ah, see, they got what was coming to them. I knew it was going to happen, bless God. I've been telling them this was coming, and they got what's coming to them. That's a touch of envy. It takes pleasure at other people's failure. It takes displeasure at other people's success. If you have to down people whenever favor happens in their life, and you have to say, well, why do they get favor and I don't get favor? That's envy. I'm not on a sin hunt. James does this first. We're just trying to tell you why he does it, okay? We're not on a sin hunt going, I want you to examine your life today to see if there's any envy in you. We're just trying to show you the two kinds of wisdom. And a lot of us are slipping into the sensual, earthly wisdom when we should be living in the elevated wisdom of heaven. And so we want to get to that, uh, get to that place where it's easy to recognize and differentiate between the two. But envy was, a, was a, a, a murderous problem in the early church. I want to show you the Apostle Paul dealing with it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll begin in verse 1, and you'll see envy crop up in verse 3. I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, 
not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you're still carnal. For where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Oh man, I love that phrase. Hear that again. Wherever there's envy and strife and divisions, is that not carnal? I'd say yes, that's carnal. But what is it like? It's like mere men. What's the opposite of mere men? He must think his audience is supermen. He doesn't think they're supermen. He thinks they're new creations. And if you're new creations, you ought not be acting like mere men. I love the idea that Paul doesn't think I'm a mere man. He thinks I'm more than a mere man. He thinks you're more than a mere man because you're in Christ. If you were a mere M-E-R-E, just a mere man, just, a, just an average, just the ordinary guy, then it would be acceptable to be envious and have divisions and strife and sectarianism, which is really the main point of this passage, because the next phrase is, who's Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. So it's, it's basically a, a, a statement against sectarianism. Don't say, well, I'm of this guy and I'm of this guy and we're better and you're worse. And Paul says the root of that is envy. It's, it's this rejoicing that you got it right and other people got it wrong. Or it's this jealousy that God blessed this guy, but God didn't bless you. Or this ministry is being prospered. My ministry is not being prospered. Uh, what do I need to do to be in the position that this person is in? It's a killer of ministry. And it must have been a real, real problem in the early church. Let me show you where Paul goes with it. That's chapter 3. Ten chapters later, after he has dealt with the church through different lenses, he's dealt with, with sin in the church, he's dealt with confusion among how to use the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, there, there's a whole list of things that 1 Corinthians delves into. It's his longest letters, First and Second Corinthians, because there's a lot of stuff. So he gets into the 13th chapter. He transitions out of the 12th. The 12th is the gifts of the Spirit in operation in, that, in the church. And then he says, I want to show you guys a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I don't have charity or love, then I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In other words, you can be as spiritual as you'd like, but if you don't love people, then you're just, you're just yakking, man. You're just wasting time. You're like two pieces of metal banging together. No one's impressed. And man, I found that to be true. You can be so locked in on trying to show people how spiritual you are and then not display love, and who cares? It doesn't do any good. So out of that thought, Paul develops his definition of who God is. Now, a lot of times, 1 Corinthians 13 is used at weddings. I've done hundreds <laughs> of weddings, and probably 50% of them want this chapter read, 1 Corinthians 13, because it's a description of love. But I hope you realize 1 Corinthians 13 was never written as a description of marital love. It was, it was written as a description of God. Why? Because 1 John tells us God is love. It never says, he doesn't say God is holy. God is uh, jealous. God is selfish. God is... God is love. Paul takes the thought and says love is this. We did a sermon months ago. It's available at our website called uh, God is love and love is. And we went dot, dot, dot because we wanted you to, the whole sermon then was exposing to you what love is. Well, how do we know what love is? 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long. Love is kind. I'm in verse 4. Love does not Envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. Bears things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Never fails. I'm not focusing on 1 Corinthians 13. I hope you caught it in verse 4. Love does not envy. The very thing that Paul exposes in 1 Corinthians 3 as a problem in the, in the Corinthian church the very thing James exposes as earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom in James 3, Paul says love's the opposite. Love never envies. Love doesn't do the things that are so common on the earth, which is why planet earth is not familiar with the love of God. 
because the love of God doesn't know how to rejoice when you fail. It doesn't know how to feel bad when you feel good. God doesn't... See, you it, feeling at peace and at rest and go, oh, no, why are they this way? Love doesn't feel that way about you. And so as we become saturated with the love of God, knowing God loves me, giving love back to people, one of the things that departs out of our life is envy. That insanity of hoping someone else doesn't do it as well as us or hoping we are better than someone else. Take it back to James for a moment. Not for a moment, but back to our, to our passage. And let's deal with the other twin killer of ministry, the subtitle of this passage in James, which is selfish ambition. I want to get personal for a little bit. I don't know how to, to, to preach or teach any other way than to use my testimony, my background. And some guy's testimony is I did drugs and I murdered someone and I went to prison and I got out and I was an alcoholic and Jesus delivered me. And I've always thought, wow, what a testimony. Mine is, uh, you know, I got saved when I was a little kid and I was raised in the church. I went into the ministry um, when I was 15 years old and I dedicated my life really to preaching the gospel didn't make me any better. I thought it made me better. I really did for many years. That's how I preached. Like I was better than you. And like, I knew more than you and like God liked me more than he liked you because he called me and here I am. It's stupid. And my ministry early on was so based on selfish ambition. It was to build a ministry, to build this thing that people would look at and say, Oh, that's a man of God. He is so holy. I wish we could be like him. And I thought if they could do that, I would have told you, well, I want you to see Jesus. But deep down inside, I just wanted this big, app, uh, this big influential platform. There was a lot of selfish ambition in that. And selfish ambition is so often masked by the word vision. What, one thing I've noticed in ministry is vision becomes a big theme uh, in ministry very quickly. Guys will go into ministry and they'll pastor a church and they will have vision. And they'll present the vision to the church and they'll put it on a banner and they'll hang it on the wall. And the old church rallies around the vision and they'll say, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so they'll say, here's our vision in this church. If you're on board with this vision, we want you to do this. And then it'll be sign up to help this or give towards this ministry. And a lot of times vision is used as a way to get you to give. It's used as a way to get you to work. It's used as a way to get you to commit. In fact, if you go to pastor seminars, you might hear the, the speaker say, one of the reasons why some of you guys are having trouble getting people to commit to your church and get active in your church is because you haven't clearly put the vision out in front of them. If you'll clearly put the vision out in front of them, your people will run towards it. While I believe there's a lot of truth to a lot of that, I have been around long enough to discover this. A lot of what we're calling vision is just naked self-ambition. It's just masked over with the fig leaves of vision. It is selfish ambition. It is a desire to prove that our system works to all of our detractors, to those that said we weren't able. We want to show them, I know how to build a church. I know how to build a ministry. I know how to build a thing. And that ambition is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Why? Because it's the same thing the world uses every day to get ahead. It has no place in a believer's life. I don't mean believers shouldn't be ambitious at their job and want to do well. Or they shouldn't want to improve themselves with their education. Not at all. But we have to lay our ambition at the altar of Christ, at the, at the, at the cross where Christ paid for our lives. We have to lay our ambition there and, and be honest with ourselves in understanding whether or not we're presenting Jesus so that people will see Jesus, or whether or not we're presenting self so that people will see self. Let me tell you something. 
One of the greatest motivators that I have had recently in my life, everybody's familiar with our move, our relocation. We moved our family across the country, and I'm no longer pastoring a local church. We still do a lot of preaching, a lot of traveling, and a lot of people call us pastor because we still pastor a lot of people via this right here. And that's fine. And I'm, I'm okay with whatever the Lord, ha however He does it. Um, but one of my motivators is that my brother and I are, have bought a business here in Southern California and trying to get that up off the ground and get that rolling. Um, I am so motivated to see my income shift into the realm of business out of the realm of it being totally dependent on ministry. Not because in any way I want out of the ministry, but because I want to see the monetized ministry model minimized, where we don't monetize the ministry, my preference is, at all, to where uh, I would even love it if, and this is, and I'm, I'm prophesying this in Jesus' name, if the, I want to see the day come when I can look in this camera or say it onto the DDP and say, hey, don't give anymore. We Don't give anymore. We don't need it. We, the, the Lord has structured our income through this business, or we're so blessed in this way. Instead of giving to us, we want you to give to this. We want you to give to this ministry. We want you to give to this charity. Um, or we're, or uh, now all of that you give is going into this. That is a dream of mine. And it's because I so badly want to see the purity of the gospel message brought back to where there's no hint of selfish ambition. There's no hint of self-servingness. To where the gospel is so freely given uh, that there's no, um, there's no stick them up. you got to give towards this. I, I don't know how you should deal with it. If you feel like you're in a church and, and you feel like, man, there's a lot of selfish ambition. I know how I would deal with it. If I felt like there was a lot of selfish ambition, this guy's trying to build something and it's not the church. He's trying to build a ministry leave. I mean, that's my advice, but, but really follow the spirit. Just do as he would have you to do. I know he's not going to have you go in there and put an ax in the middle of it and bust up a church. Um, that's not his working, but he might have you move on. Um, I might be talking to ministers and maybe there's that hint inside of you. you go, man, I don't know. This doesn't feel like why I went into the ministry. Um, I wanted to see people helped. I wanted to ch see lives changed. I wanted to pull grave clothes off of resurrected people. But now I'm doing this and I'm, I'm having this and we, you know, we got to run the budget and we got to build the building and we got to secure the land. And we got... Are we doing it because it's the vision to do good or are we doing it to build somebody up? And, and does it rise or fall on somebody? Um, I've, had to, I've had to seek God more than once even in the last several months, and say, Father, you know, I look at where I came from. I look at when we were at Midland and at the church, and I think we're being a blessing to a lot of people. But I had to say, Lord, when I left, there was, it was so evident that a lot of it was built on me. And forgive me, Father, where did I, where did I go wrong where so much of it began to be built on me? Why wasn't there a sustainable thing after I left? And, and there is, there's a lot of good even being done there. Now my dad's pastor at Midland and, and there's good being done there. But I had to acknowledge to the Lord and say, Father, I don't want to fall into that place again where it's built around me. I just want it to be built around you. So I'm not trying to build some building or anything else. I just want you to know that there's a wisdom that is that is of the earth, and then there's a wisdom that is of heaven. Check your ambition at the door. Father, why am I doing this? What is my motivation? And I personally believe that if your motivation is outside of family and relationships, you need to reevaluate it because God's all about relationship. And so if it's to support the family, to support the relationship, then I think that's pure. And we're going to get into the word pure. In fact, let's move on. We're envy and self-existing or selfish ambition exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. And man, there is going to be spiritual confusion and evil things there. Let's hit 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruit without partiality, and without hypocrisy. This 
17th verse does not only describe heavenly wisdom, it describes the wisdom of God, or better said, it really describes God. This is a description of who He is. Let's go slowly and soak it up. He's pure. He's peaceable. He's gentle. He's willing to yield. Willing to yield is a little bit off from the Greek to the English. Willing to yield sounds like um, he's willing to let you do what you want to do, which he does let you do what you want to do, but that's not what it means. The text actually in the Greek is closer to easily entreatable. He's easy to, to, to talk to. He's easy to entreat. He is never, I got to emphasize this, he's never distant, far off, hard to get a hold of. Oh, I just wish God would hear my prayer. Why is God not listening? He's easily entreatable. And the wisdom that comes from God is easily entreatable wisdom, full of mercy, good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Without partiality seems simple. Without hypocrisy? Who would ever accuse God of being a hypocrite? I just I did a sermon that will air on our website in a few weeks from Tehachapi, California. We we used Matthew 16, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get get on a sidetrack and preach a different sermon. You'll hear it in a few weeks. Um, and if you're watching this later, go look for beware with an exclamation point. That's the sermon. And in beware, we deal with the word hypocrite and what it means. And I won't, I won't get ahead of myself, but hypocrisy here is not about faking it, trying to be one thing than being another. It's really about image. It's about projecting something so that other people will think something of you. God does not project something so you'll think something of him. God just is what he is. True heavenly wisdom is not about, I've got to project an image today at work. i got to project a persona to my boss, to my employees. Check that at the door and be the real you. Be heavenly wisdom instead of earthly, sensual, and demonic. And then I love 18, and I've never really... I've not heard enough teaching on this. I, I just feel something powerful in my spirit about the 18th verse. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Notice the sown. It's sown. Fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. If you want fruit, you got to sow. If you want, I got an orange tree right outside that window. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. A Missouri boy moving to California, we don't have orange trees. I have an orange tree about 20 feet from me. Somebody had to plant that tree, cultivate that tree, and then oranges come off of that tree. And we benefit. But if you don't sow it and cultivate it, you don't get the orange. I'm not talking about works, but I'm talking about a work. There is a work that goes into it, which is sowing the orange so, and then letting it grow, and now we get oranges off of it. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. If you want the fruit of righteousness in your community, in your home, in your job, in your wallet, in your body, if you want the fruit of righteousness, who doesn't? You're going to have to sow it in peace. And the reason why, I felt this so powerfully this morning in my spirit, the reason why we do not see the righteousness of God in our communities is because we're not sowing in peace. We're sowing in conflict. The gospel's been presented from an angry point of view for so long. It's been presented as mixture. It's been presented aggressively. We always fight the sinner. We're always verbally spatting against each other. We're not looking to bring peace between parties. We're looking to be right and prove that you're wrong. As long as we're looking to be right and prove our neighbor wrong, we're not sowing in peace. If we don't sow in peace, we don't get the fruit of righteousness. So if you want the fruit of righteousness, sow in peace. It's so simple. It's sown in peace of those who make peace. So sow it into people. And I jotted a few things down. We have to sow into our, let's say, community. I'm not just talking about your next door neighbor, I'm talking about your life. You sow into your community, and to do that, you do it in peace. So in peace, you're going to have to learn how to get along with people. You're going to have to learn how to treat people with dignity and respect and honor. And if you don't like that, then you're going to sow in anger and judgment and condemnation. And you're going to say, well, I can't accept them for who they are because the Bible doesn't accept them. God does accept them through the finished work of Jesus. So when are we going to sow in peace instead of sowing in anger? I, 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 I get 
weary at the, at the confrontational spirit. Even among grace people, we just want to sit and fight each other all the time over doctrine and getting so mad at, at somebody who disagrees with us, mocking people for their stance. Sarcasm has become the new way to argue, too. And I, I feel like it's the cowardly way. It's, it's, it's ignorance personified when you can only argue with sarcasm. Um, it's the look-at-me mentality. We're going to get into a verbal spat, but you look at me and watch how... Well, I make the crowd go, ooh, and ah. And a little bit of that is our, our kind of sports center mentality. We got to see the dunk and the home run. And we, all, we argue that way. We got to, what little quip can I come up with? And all it does is sow discord. And if we're sowing discord, we're not sowing peace. If we're not sowing peace, we're not going to have the fruit of righteousness. I'll finalize it with this statement. I wrote this down today. We are not seeing a healthy community of righteousness because we haven't been willing to put the work in of getting along with people and living in peace. And a lot of grace people go, well, I don't believe in any works. For... We're not talking about works for your righteousness. Put the work in at getting along with people. And as you put the work in to get along with people, watch the fruit of righteousness come out. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for your people. I'm believing that this word is real and it is powerful. Let it soak down in us. Teach us how to do the work of sowing into our community in peace so that we reap your righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you that the next time, which should be next week, uh, unless we have a scheduling conflict, we'll post another video that will pick up the teaching in James chapter 4 and we'll try to get through six or so verses before we, before we move into another section. I'm having a blast. I hope you're enjoying yourself. Take, your, take advantage of all of our free material at paulwhiteministries.com. Also, and I tell this all the time, and I still have people in our ministry that don't know we have a free app. Go to the App Store and look for Paul White Ministries. It won't cost you anything. You can put it on your phone, your iPad, and you can download our stuff all the time. And there's all kinds of free material. If the Holy Spirit has dealt with you to support us and partner with us, you listen to the Holy Spirit. We don't ask for much. We just say, listen to the Lord. If He never puts anything on your heart, you just keep feeding. Don't worry about it. All right? We love you. We'll see you soon. God bless you.